Hello, everybody. Roger says hey. Scarlet says hey, too. She's on my uh, bed back here playing. Say hi, Scarlet. So a while back I did a video on how Britain nuked America, and in that video they talked an awful lot about the Avro Vulcan bomber, which was a British plane back during the Cold War era. I've had a lot of requests from you guys to... Um, hang on. She got a new toy from Steve over in the UK. Thank you, Steve. And she's loving playing with it. So anyway, we're gonna learn about the uh, Vulcan bomber more today. Now, a lot of your comments on my video regarding Britain nuking America wanted me to watch some videos on the Vulcan raids in the Falklands. And there were a couple of other mentions as well, but they were longer documentaries and I will do those. But first, I kind of just wanted to get more familiar with the plane itself. This is actually something I would like to do more of is kind of learn about a lot of the equipment used, especially when it comes to like the Air Force and stuff. I don't know. There's just something extra interesting to me about the Air Force. And I just wanted to kind of circle back to the Vulcan because this is something that I've been meaning to do for like weeks and well ever since that video came out I've been meaning to do this and so today is finally the day. Now I searched on YouTube and I just wanted to find a general video that kind of just told me more about the plane and I came across this one on the Captain Joe channel and Captain Joe is going to basically explain the Abra Vulcan to us. So I'm excited to learn more about this plane. I hope he brings up the design similarities with the Concorde as well because that's something that I I noticed and a lot of you guys commented on that in that video as well. So I think it's really cool that we're going to see a pilot kind of explaining this plane to us. This video has a lot of views so I hope it's good. Hey friends and followers, welcome back to my channel and lovely greetings from the Avro Heritage Museum here at the old Woodford Airfield in the UK. Today we'll be looking at this amazing aircraft, the Avro Vulcan Bomber. We'll talk about the history of this incredible plane, speak about one of its most famous missions and about its future. Fire in the hole and let's get started. Vulcan, runway 09 at cleared, low approach, service wind 0, five zero degrees, seven knots. What you see here in the back- This music, by the way, that they're playing, we play this at all of our graduations here. Does this have a different meaning over in the UK, I'm assuming? Because I would not expect it to be paired with a video about a bomber. Did low approach, service wind zero, five zero degrees, seven knots. What you see here in the background is an Elliot Verdon Row, short for Avro B-2 Vulcan Bomber. The Vulcan is, or was, a jet-powered, tailless, delta-wing, high-altitude strategic bomber which was operated by the Royal Air Force from 1956 to 1984. She is one of three models which were designed at the end of the 1940s. The Vickers Valiant, the Hanley Page Victor, and the Vulcan, but better known as the V-Bombers or the Bomber Command Main Force. Now the V-Bomber Force reached its peak in June 1964 with 50 Valiants, 70 Vulcans, and 39 Victors in service. Wow, that's way more than I thought that there were. For some reason, I thought that this was a more specialized plane and they were, there wouldn't be that many, what do you say, 70 of the Vulcans? Yeah, well, it says right here on the screen. Yeah, 70 Vulcans, 50 Valiants, and the Victors. Also a question about the um, Air Force in the UK. Is it, was it bigger back then than it is now or are they about the same size now? But the even more astonishing fact is the plane that preceded the Vulcan was no other than the famous Avro Lancaster bomber, which played a major role winning the Second World War. Now to think that the last Avro Lancaster rolled out of the assembly line in 1947, and nine years later, this plane takes off into the sky, is out of this world. Let's say it's a quantum leap of aviation engineering by Roy Chadwick, who was the technical director and designer of both of these aircraft. But why did he build this plane in the first place? Now, at the end of the Second World War, the Ministry of Supply distributed a so-called specification B-35-46 explaining what kind of type of aircraft the country needs in case of another war. Oh my gosh, okay. All right, I'm stopping this. I gotta go put her uh, 
downstairs or something. Okay, sorry about that, guys. You know, sometimes I can have her in here when I do videos, and sometimes it just doesn't work. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go back a little bit. ...of aviation engineering by Roy Chadwick, who was the technical director and designer of both of these aircraft. But why did he build this plane in the first place? Now, at the end of the Second World War, the Ministry of Supply distributed a so-called specification B-35-46 explaining what kind of type of aircraft the country needs in case of another war. And these specifications read a medium-range bomber capable of carrying a 10,000-pound bomb to a target 1,500 nautical miles away from base, which may be anywhere <coughs> in the world. A and as I learned, uh, one of those targets was here in the U.S. <laughs> Cruising speed of 500 knots at an altitude of 35,000 to 50,000 feet and a maximum weight when fully loaded without fuel ought not to exceed 100,000 pounds. In addition to a special bomb, for example an atomic bomb, the aircraft was to be capable of alternatively carrying a conventional bomb load of 20,000 pounds. Now as you see the Vulcan meets all these specifications and the first B-1 was delivered to the RAF in 1956. After that, it followed by an even larger and more advanced B-2 in 1960. But now the question- I have a question. Um, the, the camo design on the top of it, is that just kind of like make it look cool? Because I feel like, I don't know, that wouldn't blend into the sky nearly quite as well as maybe more of just like a, a solid color. I don't, I don't really know how like aircraft design works, but I just really find it interesting that um, they decided to put a camo pattern on it. I don't think I recall seeing a plane that looked like that before. More advanced B-2 in 1960. But now the question is, why would the Brits need a bomber capable of dropping an atomic bomb in the first place? Well, Britain wasn't really at war with anybody after the Second World War, but as the Cold War started to escalate between the Soviet Union and the NATO, the Americans, being best friends with the Brits, used the island as a strategic landing site or a base to refuel their planes, respectively their B-52 bombers. In case nuclear war broke out with the Soviet Union. So being an ally with the Americans, England put themselves into harm's way, and if the Soviets man up with nuclear deterrent, there's no need by fighting back with conventional bombs or machine guns. So England literally had to prepare themselves for nuclear war, as the Americans did too. Now, I don't want to go into much detail about the Cold War, but one significant matter I have to mention. Now, now, during that time, the V-bomber squadrons anywhere in the UK were constantly ready to be airborne with only four minutes. And at the peak of the Cuba crisis in October 1962, Vulcans and Victors were sitting on the runway with running engines to be in the air within seconds heading eastbound in case the Soviets launched a nuclear attack against America. Wow, Luck I didn't know any of this. I always just thought that the Cold War was basically, you know, the U.S. and the Soviets. I didn't know that. I mean, obviously, I know we we're we we're allies with the U.K., um, but I didn't know that the U.K. was on standby like that. I didn't know that they had developed this and their nuclear bombs kind of in response to Russia as well. So you guys were way more involved in the Cold War because usually it, like it's just it's always just presented like it's a US USSR thing. So this is really the first I'm hearing about the UK also being involved like this. Uh, I, I had no idea, especially about the Cuban thing too. Huh, very impressive. Very impressive UK. Luckily, history proved us otherwise. But there was one war the Vulcan had a major impact, which was in 1982 when Argentina Falcons. invaded a British territory, the Falkland Islands. Now to break it down, Leopoldo Galtrieri, the president of Argentina at the time, hoped to win back his struggling popularity by creating patriotism and divert public attention from Argentina's economic problems and win over the Falkland Islands. Galtrieri was confident that the Brits couldn't care less about the islands as they were 16,000 miles away, but not Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. After diplomatic efforts had failed, she assembled a task force to recover them. 
6,000 troops and 30 warships headed towards the Falkland Island. Now the biggest threat though were Argentinian fighter jets which were equipped with anti-ship missiles built by the French, thank you very much, which sank <laughs> HMS Sheffield on the 4th of May in 1982. Besides harming the Argentinian Air Force British Harrier jets, the easiest way of getting rid of the fighter jets was by destroying the captured airport and runway of Port Stanley. And that's where the Vulcan came back into action. No one really had the Vulcan on their mind anymore because, to be honest, the last real usage was during the Cold War 20 years ago. But it was more or less written off, but not for the Royal Air Force and the military government at the time. So the Vulcan squadrons were back in action, but there was one major problem, range. Due to the specifications given in 1947, the Vulcan was never intended to fly such long distance missions. So in the space of three weeks, the mechanics refitted the Vulcan's refueling hoses, which they've taken out 20 years ago, and they were scrapping parts from retired planes to get the job done. And rumors actually say that one of the parts was actually used as an ashtray in the pilot's lounge. <laughs> it's pretty British. So the biggest hurdle was the sheer distance to the Falklands and back. Now, on a long stretch to the Falklands, the 16,000 miles away, they could use the British Island Ascension as midway base, but that still left them a round trip of 8,000 miles to the Falklands, double the Vulcan's maximum range. Now, the only solution was then air-to-air -air refueling, a lot of refueling. It took 11 victors flying in formation, 11 refueling procedures to fuel one Vulcan, which then just had about enough fuel to fly the attack at Stanley Airport, drop the bombs, and then fly back to Ascension. I okay, my question about about this is, did Britain not have other bombers that might be that maybe had like better range or something like that? It seems like the Vulcan is more of a specialized plane, and this seems like a fairly routine bombing mission. I mean, you're just trying to take out some airstrips, right? So, was a Vulcan necessary for this? Did Britain not have other bombers that would be a little bit more efficient than this? You guys have to fill me in on kind of what the um, stock of aircraft was that the UK had at this point. As they were reaching the controlled airspace of the Falklands, the Vulcan then went into a low-level flight at 300 feet to hide from the Argentinian radar, and 20 miles prior to the target, they climbed up to 10,000 feet and opened the bomb bay, and seconds before reaching the target, 21 bombs were released, and luckily, the first bomb hit and destroyed the runway. Okay, so maybe they were using the Vulcan just because it had these these capabilities of um, like evading the radar, I guess. So maybe that's why. Maybe their other planes weren't capable of doing that, so they wanted the element of surprise. So that's understandable, I guess. The Vulcan then was under heavy attack as it was spotted by the enemy's radar and just after dropping the bombs, and then the pilots and the Vulcan made an immediate 180 degree turn and fled the scene and flew back to Ascension Is this actual footage as from that? quickly as they could, finding also another victor to refuel them. And once they were connected to the refueling plane, knowing they were safe and their mission was a success, the navigator in true British fashion put on chariots of fire and played it over the intercom system. <laughs> Is that from a, is this from a movie right here? It was a shock to the Argentinian military forces to see what the Royal Air Force was capable of doing. Fixing up their outdated, nearly retired Vulcans with refueling hoses and flying them 16,000 miles to drop 21 bombs, they have come to the realization if the Brits are bold enough to do that, they might have more in store. So after the completion of this mission, the Black Buck mission was called, it hit the Argentinians hard as they lost their superiority in the air. So this was then one of the last significant missions of the B-2 Vulcan bomber. It was sadly then retired in 1984, and from 1984 to 2015, only a few rare Vulcans were kept serviceable, which could be seen as the centerpiece of various air shows in Britain. X-Ray Hotel 558, for example, the Spirit of Britain was the last Vulcan to be seen in the sky after 2.5 million pounds were raised by the public 
to preserve the plane and keep her air worthy. People wow. always gazed into the sky when the Vulcan did a low pass, creating the ever so famous Vulcan howl as the four Olympus engines were sucking in massive amounts of air through its relatively small intakes. Distinctive delta wow. wing shape. Okay, a lot of you guys did mention this in my previous video too. They, you wanted me to listen to the how. That I'm gonna listen to that again. That sounds like I don't know. It's almost like a demon in the sky, you know, screeching or something. Distinctive delta wing shape. Yeah, if I was on the ground and I was an enemy and I heard that, I would uh, probably be freaking out because I know I was about to die. Although in fairness, they probably don't make that sound when they're about to approach their target because I would kind of like give away <laughs> that they're there, right? So not only looked good, but it also proved distinctive delta wing shape not only looked good, but it also proved to be very effective as the plane felt like flying a fighter jet. During the inauguration flight, the test pilot even performed a barrel roll. Not that it ever had to use that in combat, but it was nice to know that it could. <laughs> Sadly, we won't be seeing the Vulcan in the sky anytime soon due to the way it was built. The Vulcan has a hydraulic system like any other plane, but unfortunately no proper backup system. For instance, only one rudder on the vertical stabilizer compared to a 747 which has two or an Airbus 8320 which has three ways to back it up. And therefore, the airworthiness of this plane can't be granted by the Civil Aviation Authority because it is a civil plane now, and that keeps the plane grounded. Mm. Now, the owners of the remaining Vulcans sometimes take them out for a taxi and takeoff runs, which are a huge attraction for the public. But I'm sure the remaining pilots would just love to pass V1 and rotate her into the air. Well, on that sad note, that's it for today. So if you have the time and you live in the Manchester area, I highly recommend you guys to come down here to the Avro Heritage Museum and to check out this great aeroplane. Get a tour by one of their former Vulcan pilots or many volunteers who work down here and know a lot about this plane. So click onto the link in the description box below for the opening hours, tickets and much, much more information. Such a unique shape. Like, we call it the delta shape. Just looks like a huge bird, you know, in the sky flying around. This looks really cool with the red planes going around. What are these red planes, by the way? You guys let me know what those are called. This formation, though, looks really cool. I love the um, the red color of the planes. In that previous clip, they were also like matching height as well. Whenever they would, you know, turn, they all kind of like lifted up at the same time. That was really cool. That was really cool to watch. I just the precision that these pilots have to fly with is just always fun to watch. So the contrails. How. So very cool. I really liked that look at the Abra Vulcan, learning a little bit about its history and how it was used. So what other famous missions did it go on? It seemed like to, to me on here, the way he presented it here, it was kind of like it was just like your standby plane for the uh, atomic bombs and then you use it for the Falklands. I'm sure it was used in other missions as well, but if you could fill me in on what some of those were, I'd appreciate it. From what I'm getting from this, this is a very, very iconic plane for Britain. Maybe in the same way that like the B-2 stealth bomber is over here for the US. I mean, when people see that plane, it's very, very distinctive looking. Everybody kind of knows what it is. 
Games. I feel like this is kind of like Britain's version of that. And it shows just how much the public loved it when they raised those funds to keep it going. So from here, I would like to learn more about his mission to the Falklands. I actually don't know much about the Falklands. I haven't done any videos on that before. And prior to starting this YouTube channel, I had never heard of it. I didn't even know the Falklands was a territory of Britain. So I know that there are a lot of other videos I can watch about this. One of my followers on Twitter, Karen Blackadder, has given me a lot of links to videos about the Vulcan. So I might have to go back through some of my messages from her and look those up. And if you guys can answer any of my questions in the comments below, I would appreciate it. Also make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. And I have links to all of my social media and my Discord server in the description and in my pinned comment if you're interested in any of that. Roger here and I would like to thank you guys for watching as always. Make sure you stay tuned for more stuff like this coming up and we will see you next time.